The following is a local resident producer's program. The program content is the sole responsibility of the producer and does not necessarily reflect the views or policies of CATV2, Oshkosh Community Media Services, the City of Oshkosh, or Time Warner Cable. Everybody, welcome to Ion Oshka. Cheryl Hentz here, and uh, Dan Rylance and I are happy to be joined this evening by um, our Director of Community Development for the City of Oshkosh, Alan Davis, is here. We're going to be talking about uh, economic development uh, things that are going on in and around Oshkosh. So, welcome. We're happy to have you here. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah. And we made the weather a little bit cooler for you tonight. I appreciate so, that. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Although we're in an air-conditioned building, so it doesn't matter that much. That but when helps. you leave, it'll yeah. be more comfortable than mm -hmm. it has been. So anyway, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on around town. New, new buildings going up. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, some other buildings that are empty and still sitting, and, mm -hmm. you know, we'll touch on that. But I, I want to start by asking about the uh, CVS drugstore proposal. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's sort of been bandied about for, gosh, seems like a lot of months. Mm -hmm. And, you know, issues that they had proposed were shot down at one level or another. Now they're back with another proposal. Mm -hmm. um, this, I believe, the plan commission approved. Recommended approval, um, yes. When is that going before the council and tell folks how it differs from what they had wanted to do in the past? Uh, it's going to the city council next Tuesday. I think that's the 26th. Okay, so when yeah. this airs, it will already be in front of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the latest proposal they brought back uh, responded to some of the concerns the neighborhood had regarding the, the potential negative impacts. Mm -hmm. If you recall, when it was first submitted, uh, the plan commission and the council turned it down, basically. Mm -hmm. They came back, actually city staff met with representatives from the neighborhood and we identified a bunch of things that uh, we thought would improve the site plan. Uh, big items were moving the building as far to the south as we could away from the neighbors, so we increased the buffer area, increased the vegetation. Uh, we orient, reoriented and brought down the, si the height of the sign that they wanted to put out there. Okay. Uh, we've also uh, made sure that the uh, storm water was going to be addressed by uh, putting detention underneath the storm, uh, the parking lot, so you won't even see it, but it will be mm. retained on the property. That's their plan right now. Uh, they also came back with the 7th Avenue, and that's probably a, a big issue with the neighborhood because sure. they're concerned about the, the traffic impact. Uh, the CVS uh, proposal in, included moving the 7th Avenue access at Keller further to the north and west on Keller, so uh, it would actually uh, kind of combine the parking lot driveway of Red Robin with the 7th Avenue driveway. Okay. And there'd be one driveway, it'd be a public driveway, so that'd move it farther west. That would allow people to make the full right turn and left turn out of 7th, because right now you can't make a left turn out of 7th because that median from the roundabout comes down and you can't do that legally. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that would allow the full turn there. Uh, the other thing that CVS was proposing to do to respond to the neighbors was to uh, kind of close 7th Avenue between Lilac and their driveway uh, so that none of their commercial traffic could interfere or interrupt the residential neighborhood, uh, which is uh, responding to the neighbors, uh, although I must say the Traffic Review Board has looked at that and they're recommending not doing that to the City Council. City Council still has the final say. Sure. So. Sure. Uh, with the traffic, uh, the city required traffic impact studies to see what kind of impact there would be on the neighborhood and on 7th and on 9th. Uh, based on our review of the traffic impact study, uh, the, the traffic count was going to be so low there wouldn't be any negative impact on the neighborhood. Of course, the neighbors uh, have a different opinion of that, mm -hmm. uh, but CVS was willing to cut off their access 
to that neighborhood completely and make everybody go out uh, to Keller. Uh, so that's what they propose, and they're willing to make the the investment because they'd be responsible for paying for both the improvement at 7th and Keller and with closing the road to vehicular traffic. Just to, to clarify, people could still walk through and bike through. Mm -hmm. Emergency vehicles could, could get through, but uh, public uh, autos and trucks wouldn't be able to get through. Okay. Well, it certainly seems like CVS is, is mm -hmm. trying to be a good neighbor and, and you know, addressing people's concerns to the extent that they can without impacting, you know, the profitability of, of their business, mm -hmm. you know, and the viability of it. And after all, that's what a business is there for, is to make money. Mm -hmm. um, for people who don't know, and I'm sure that there are some out there, the CVS store itself is going to face, it's going to be on what street? It'll face 9th. Okay, so those apartments that are there, I think there's some fourplexes there or something? Yes, um, kind of in the middle of the block. Yeah, mm -hmm. so those are going to be gone. They'd be removed, And yes. that's where the store, will, where the CVS it store would basically will go, go sort of. Yes, sorry to interrupt. It no, would go from A&E Jewelers uh, through the insurance building, uh, through the uh, apartments that you mentioned, and it goes to the houses that front on Westfield. Those would stay. Everything else on that block to A&E Jewelers would be part of the CVS site. Okay. You know, my concern about um, that whole area, because there's a quick trip going in sort of kitty corner from where the CVS would go. On the south side of night. Yep, mm -hmm. yep. And there's a lot of stuff being sort of jammed in there. Mm -hmm. And I understand it's a high profile type area lots of traffic comes through there so I'm sure that that makes it more desirable for these businesses but with some of this stuff most of it actually being so close to the roundabout I fear that there's going to be more accidents and we still see people who are coming out of the Walgreens parking lot turning left there aren't signs that prohibit that but there's arrows pointed on you know painted on the parking lot mm -hmm. that show that you should be turning to the right but you still see a lot of people turning to the left and you know there's people speed through the roundabouts we all know that right, right. and there's bound to be an accident especially when you put more businesses there is there anything that's going to be addressed so that people can't be turning left out of well out of Walgreens parking lot for one I know that they're going to try and address things so mm -hmm. that you can't turn a certain way out of CVS correct on 7th mm -hmm. uh, but on 9th they would be able to make the left turn they're going to be uh, far enough away from the roundabout that the traffic engineers feel that there's enough uh, spacing that they can make that left turn. I'm not saying they're going to be able to make that at all times of the day because I've been, everybody's been through there and see there's a lot of traffic. I expect there's going to be some people who are going to take a right turn and go through the roundabout and head back the other direction and kind of use the roundabout okay. as the, the turnaround because there's some times of the day that I wouldn't want to make that left-hand turn. <laughs> Yeah, yes. so now you're talking um, out of Walgreens parking lot, out, then, uh, or out of CVS. Out of CVS. Okay. They'd be able to make a right turn, go to the roundabout, and then loop around and then head back east. Rather yeah, than turning left, left is more difficult, though. Yes. So what about coming out of Walgreens parking lot, turning left, like some people still do? My expectation, if I was going to Walgreens and I wanted to, say, go west of 41, mm -hmm. I would go out on Keller and go up to the roundabout and make that turn. I wouldn't be coming out on 9th. Yeah, because then it would be a right turn. Prohibiting everybody else from mm -hmm. being able to get out of the parking lot. Period. You know, when they're sitting there trying to turn left, that is and true. they just can't. Mm -hmm. you that know, is so. true. Do you I, anticipate this thing uh, having great opposition at the council meeting next week? I expect there's going to be opposition okay. because the the neighborhood uh, yeah. still has very legitimate concerns uh, that they want to make sure are addressed as as sure. much as possible. Yeah, five two vote, six one vote. I do not know. Okay. That's why I show up too. I understand. <laughs> okay. I just <laughs> I just kidding. Let me do. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, I've been doing a little research on all this neighborhood activity that's going on. Mm -hmm. And um, I watched this PowerPoint presentation that, that Darren did with uh, I, 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 some committee. And one of the things that interests me, and I think they're going in this direction, there are four different groups in the city of Oshkosh that are kind of dealing with neighborhoods right mm -hmm. now. City of Oshkosh. Neighbor Works, Advocap, and Habitat for Humanity. Yes. And I sort of got the gist from what Darren was saying that there's some move to centralize that. Is that correct reading of that? Or well, not? coordinated. Coordinated. I'd, I'd say okay. so that we can collaborate on, on, on neighborhood initiatives okay. because there's some things that the city can do real well. Okay. There's some things we can't do very well. Okay. 
NeighborWorks can do real well on some things, and everybody has their own strengths. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're trying to build on each other's strengths okay. so that we can address as many of those concerns in a neighborhood as possible. And in some areas, we've identified some gaps, and the city's trying to, to fill some of those gaps. Okay. Uh, in the past, uh, the Near East Neighborhood Project was one of those projects that uh, didn't go over real well, is my understanding. That's kind of the first one, wasn't it? Yes. Yes. And the one thing that we're trying to do is that uh, there were certainly some, I, I guess, I characterize them as some sticks when it came to the code mm -hmm. that you had to comply with, uh, but there weren't very many carrots. Okay. And now we're looking at creating those carrots, and we've worked with NeighborWorks. Uh, we've worked with the city council to develop some other funding sources so that uh, we can use not only block grant fund, uh, money, but NeighborWorks money, uh, possibly uh, Habitat for Humanity money, and new money from the uh, for a neighbor, healthy neighborhoods initiative that Darren probably touched on there. Yeah, did. Uh, so that we'd be able to put more money towards different types of projects. Sometimes we wouldn't have to, the income requirements wouldn't apply, whereas some they would in block grant. Uh, different types of projects we can do. Uh, and also the city councils put quite a bit of money in capital improvements for those neighborhoods. And those would be improvements within the right of way or in public spaces. Uh, in those neighborhoods so that we can improve either park or street or sidewalks or things of that nature. So we're trying to, everybody can has a role to play and we're trying to maximize what everybody can do and, and make sure we have as many carrots can, as possible. Can you, if Cheryl and I wanted to start a neighborhood Association? Yeah. Do we get a license from the city to get mm, it? You don't get a license. Okay, but you have to have your approval? Uh, no, you don't no. need our approval. Uh, the city isn't in the business of actually creating the Neighborhood Association. Okay. NeighborWorks is actually working on, okay. on uh, doing that organizing of the, okay. of the committees. So um, they've, got, like, they've worked with... you got Stevens Park, you've got Middle Village, yep. you've got uh, Miller's Bay thing. Yes. Um, if I'm living in that area that they've designated as a neighborhood, do they ask me if I want to be in the neighborhood organization? Is it is a vote? It's, it's voluntary. It's voluntary. Oh, yes. Uh, okay. There's nothing that's... Uh, regulation with the neighborhood associations. Okay. Uh, they're mostly there to identify what needs to happen in the neighborhood to improve okay. the, the livability, uh, the marketability, the real estate, okay. uh, the public improvements, uh, I guess the neighborhood, any way you want to measure it. Uh, so a neighborhood association can work on anything or nothing. And we're trying to get a neighborhood association so that uh, people can see there's some kind of, again, I'll go back to those carrots, there's reasons to get involved because yeah. there's money that can sure. be used for public projects and there's money that can be used for private projects. And we're hoping to be able to build on uh, investments that we could make that will generate even more private investment. If, if somebody's looking at doing a porch, uh, can, can it be so that the city could leverage some money with the private property owner so that they can do a uh, porch and, and, and build it to a, a level that's that's really a nice architectural feature rather than the low cost version. And Shirley's looking to, I can tell she. And yeah, it, and, I, I'm, and improve I'm, the neighborhood. Yeah. I'm curious. Yeah. Um, so this, this is the door hanger that um, many people have probably seen in certain areas. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the good neighbor, this is the neighbor works thing. They're good Correct. neighbor grants for mm -hmm. the city of Oshkosh. And it's a neighbor works program, if you will, and they're sort of administering this. Yes. Um, so in order to get something from these folks, do you have to live in something that's designated as a specific neighborhood? Or no matter where you're at in the city, if, if you have some financial constraints and you need some work done on your home, can you apply for some of this money? At this point in time, you have to be in the NeighborWorks neighborhood, okay. and that's basically Main Street East and up to Packer. Okay. It, it doesn't follow that exactly. Uh, their website shows exactly where they we're talking about. But that's just for now. They do want to expand that okay. as we build some momentum, and certainly we're, we're looking to be able to provide this wherever we need in the city, east, west, north, south. Okay. But we've got to start somewhere, and it's kind of a test program. Sure, sure. Uh, so that's why we're testing it out with their NeighborWorks area right now, and that's actually what we're looking at with the Healthy Neighborhoods Initiative uh, to target that type of, and it's kind of a test pilot thing. As time goes by, we expect we're gonna be able to get more money towards these types of projects and be able to expand that. Okay. We're hoping that we can leverage close to a million dollars mm. from different sources into the first target neighborhood and as time goes by we want to build on that so that we have more money available for no more neighborhoods. Okay, and but the money through the uh, rental rehabilitation program 
that the city mm -hmm. is doing, and I believe also Habitat for Humanity and in you know their neighborhood projects and Advocaps. Those you can live anywhere and apply for that, money. Correct. That is, that is correct. As and I'm sure that the qualifications are different with each different program. And yes, I can so. speak to the cities. I don't know Habitats and Advocaps uh, sure. so well, yeah. uh, but that one is an income qualifying program, uh, and the landlord has to be uh, willing to rent to qualified individuals uh, for a period of I think it's five or ten years. So, I'd have to look so that is up. that uh, when you say they have to be willing to rent to certain, you know, qualified individuals? Are we talking a Section Eight thing here? Uh, it's low and moderate income, and that's not exactly Section Eight, mm -hmm. but they do have to be, be income qualified. Okay. And then I think it's like a payback period of ten or fifteen years, okay. somewhere in that range. All right. Okay. And so there's a, a nice little um, trifold brochure that uh -huh. goes along with this that explains things. I, I'm assuming people can find this on your website, on yes. the city's website. Mm -hmm. oh, and yes. we've got that address, and so we'll be yep. putting up the city's website uh, throughout this segment as well. And City Hall as well. Mm -hmm. And just to follow up on that, yes. you mentioned that that's the rental program. We also have the owner-occupied program okay. that people could apply for. Mm -hmm. That also is income qualified, but that could be throughout the city. Okay. One other question mm -hmm. real oh, quick. Good, um, that was a good question on who qualifies for You know, mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we've heard over the years about, you know, improvements and things like that, there are some people in this community who just absolutely abhor um, the green lumber or untreated lumber mm -hmm. in, in doing porches and mm -hmm. railings and steps and that kind of thing. Is there any kind of um, you know requirement with these programs that you're aware of, especially you know the neighbor works and the one that the city is doing that says if you're going to get money for these things, you can't use untreated lumber or green lumber? In the Near East neighborhood, we actually created an overlay district, mm -hmm. and and in that uh, location. Uh, you wouldn't be able to do the green lumber. Mm -hmm. The rest of the city you can right now, okay. but I can tell you when it comes to one of the carrots, if somebody's going to be doing a porch example that I used earlier, uh, if they're putting on a green treated, they're not going to be able to get any, any funding from the city to help do that project. Uh, but if the city participates and maybe we could give, it, uh, give them a little architectural help, a little financial help, they could make it, take it from the green treated to something that's going to be more and consistent with the architectural mm -hmm. uh, history of the of the house that they're they're remodeling or adding okay. on to. Okay. So we're trying to give them a carrot to to bring up that green treated to something that's more in character with the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think these neighborhood things are, are really great, and and I've only lived here 14 years, and, and it seems to me it's really energized a lot of local areas. My devil's advocate question is, is that this city has always resisted alderman form of government for a long time. And if you create little neighborhoods within the city, are you sort of fostering maybe a return to an alderman form where my neighborhood is going to get something and I'm going to fight for my neighborhood and, rather than the city as a whole? Well, that's an interesting question. I think we want neighborhood individuals to get involved with their neighborhoods. Right. If they eventually become involved with city government, they want to run for right. city council, more power to them. Absolutely. Uh, so I would say if we generate more civic involvement, that's going to be a good thing wherever that leads us yeah. to. Okay. And that's what we're trying to No, I understand. But, to, you know, it, do. It, there's such a resistance in this city to dividing up the political decision-making in this city by districts mm -hmm. rather than as a whole. And this is kind of making it little and working within, like you asked the question, who can qualify for these things? Well, at this point, it's only those exclusive people that within that particular neighborhood. For the one program. For the one program. For the yeah. one program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's all. I was just curious. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a good point. Yeah. I hadn't really thought yeah. about that. Yeah. Well, thank you. If we had more money, we could do it the whole city. So if, we, <laughs> yeah. if you could come up with several million more well, dollars, we'll we would do that. We'll check after yeah. the show. Well, How thank you. <laughs> are, we, are we still writing checks? Yeah. Well, for uh, this, we will. Are we? I didn't realize uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for saying it's a good cause because yeah, I it think is. it's very important and yeah. we're trying to get every effort to increase the, the money that we have available to make those investments, both the public and the private side, because we certainly want to leverage as much private investment in those neighborhoods as well. Yeah. Sure, sure. One other printout from this thing is healthy neighborhoods. So I assume all of these organizations want to be, have healthy neighborhoods, but is there some movement to impose sort of some criteria for what healthy neighborhoods are? 
Uh, I'm not sure I'd, I'd say there's criteria, but we're actually getting to the point where we want to have some kind of scorecard for okay. a neighborhood. Oh, okay. That would say, this looks like kind of a scorecard. Uh, yes, and, and a lot of it is related to, say, the real estate market. Okay. Like, what, are, what is the trend with the uh, uh, values in the neighborhood? Okay. We want to see them trending up, of course. Everybody wants to see their neighborhood, their net worth increase. Uh, so that's one of the scorecards we want to okay. be using. Um, number of blighted houses. Uh, number of uh, even the pacer rating in a neighborhood with the pacer ratings that the uh, how good the street is yeah, we want to be able to say yeah, yeah. have we taken uh, the below average streets and we've brought them up to average streets for the neighborhood just as, as another way to to uh, signal or to document that the trend is in the right direction for that neighborhood uh, so that's just a couple of performance measures that I'd say we're using we've also through NeighborWorks uh, They've done a, quite a few interviews in those neighborhoods to get what people think about their neighborhoods mm -hmm. and which direction we're going. We're get, they took that picture now, and then in five years, we're going to compare and see if people think there's more. Uh, more people think that the neighborhood is either stable or getting better so that we have a, an idea that people actually want to live in these neighborhoods mm -hmm. and maybe even more people want to move in the neighborhoods because they see that, that the good things are happening. Mm -hmm. And as time goes by, those market values, will, the real estate values will go up. Um, people will be putting more investments into their properties and we'll see those assessed values or the real estate values increase over time. That's an easy one for a community development director yeah, to no, track. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I haven't been to the city's website to look at this stuff, uh, Alan, but um, my question, I guess, is on the city's website, are all these different programs, you know, the, the neighbor works, um, what the city is doing, which we know that those are mm -hmm. there, um, Advocaps and, uh, you know, Habitat for Humanities neighborhood programs. Are those all, are there links on the city's website to get mm -hmm. to all of those? Because if not, I would like to suggest, I guess, that you guys consider doing that because mm -hmm. here's my concern. Someone has work that they need to have done. They know, they hear that there's all these programs out there, but they don't know where to go, you know, to mm -hmm. necessarily reach one or the other. Mm -hmm. And it would be nice if they mm -hmm. went right That's to the idea. city's website and maybe they don't qualify for one, but they might another. They could at least, you know, click on the link mm -hmm. and that would take them to like Habitats or wherever mm -hmm. and they could at least learn about it. That's a very you know? good idea. And yet you're not really promoting it, you're just mm -hmm. providing information, giving yeah. them a, a link to. Mm -hmm get additional information. Mm -hmm. um, so well, you wrote that down, so I'm assuming that it's not on there yet. Uh, I don't know for <laughs> sure. I know there's some links, but I'm not sure it's okay. with everybody. Okay. And I know we've had meetings to coordinate between uh, NeighborWorks and the city and Habitat and AdvoCap. So my expectation is we all want to do that. I just don't know if it's okay. happened yet. Yeah, sure, yeah. sure. <laughs> Anything else uh, on the neighborhood stuff before we go on to something else? The only thing is, I'm wondering how many people in one of these neighborhood associations are really involved in creating the neighborhood. Is it two or three people, four people? Uh, is it 100 people? Boy, it really depends on the neighborhood association. Yeah. I think you do need that critical core of people who are yeah. going to be the, the, the people who serve on, serve on the board and who go to the yeah. weekly or monthly meetings. Yeah. And then I think as time goes by, you'll get some other people who participate maybe once a month or once every six months in other activities. Yeah. Uh, and I think... Uh, there's, there has to be a critical core because we can't really create a neighborhood association unless there's people who want to participate right. because they are going to be responsible for their neighborhood association will help, but we can't be the only people helping. Okay. It's got to be the neighbor uh, representatives from the neighborhood. So there's got to be a core that's going to be the six or eight who are going to be on the board and there's going to need another group that's going to be helpful and it takes time to, to develop those interests, those yeah. relationships, uh, so that as time goes by, they become more and more active and they become more self-sustaining. Right now, it's just, oh, they're, they're just in the, in the for formative stage. Still. Is there a governance and, and bylaws for each of their standards? Eventually, they eventually would need to have some be. bylaws, yes, okay. once they get a little more mature yeah. as to know what they want to, want to be doing. Well, you know, and this is just an idea, but, you know, we've got a lot of um, neighborhood watch areas in town. Mm -hmm. These are people who are already concerned about and involved in their neighborhoods. Yep. Maybe they could take it one step further and mm. 
develop a neighborhood association as well mm -hmm. using some of the same people. And in fact you that know. has happened in some of those, these early has neighborhoods. Okay. And, I, and I failed to mention Oshkosh Police Department. They were very helpful in creating the neighborhood watch because that made a pretty easy transition to mm -hmm. some of these neighborhood association members because they saw some value in helping the neighborhood in a different way but still helping the neighborhood. Yeah. So you mentioned Oshkosh Police Department. They were probably the first ones to start mm. um, in this area creating that community neighbor, neighborhood interest, the neighborhood watch. It's not too far from neighborhood watch to neighborhood improvements. That's right. Yep. And the chief police, once he became chief, has pushed this community policing from yes. the get-go. Yep. Yes. Yeah, so. And, they, and, and the, successfully so. so. Yeah, and the yeah. police department's been very helpful, yeah. even helping uh, the people in the neighbor works and in the city talk to the right people, attend the meetings, and explain what's going on. Yeah. So I can't, uh, I guess I'll, I'll give them uh, credit for okay. being one of those sure. critical pieces that help put this start this on this way. Sure. Well, it takes partnerships. It takes everybody working together. Mm -hmm. You know, no one have, yeah. no one operates in a vacuum, not successfully anyway. So that's for sure. Um, let's let's go back to the frontage road area and stuff because um, in addition to the quick the quick trip and the CVS that it may be going in, um, there's a lot of development that's happened. You know, kind of like in the like say from Staples on down mm -hmm. um, to like the Best Buy area and so mm -hmm. forth. Uh, there's a new U.S. Cellular store in there. Yes. Um, Olive Garden has been open for a month or so now. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some other stuff going in. Um, you know, talk to us a little bit about, you know, what's happening in that area besides what I just said. Okay. <laughs> well, and, and, you know, and, and how much more can we put in that area? Uh, well, uh, I can answer the first the, the first question a little easier. The Olive Garden and U.S. Cellular are new on the front. In the back, that's where the TJ Maxx is going. Mm -hmm. That's about a 25,000 square foot building. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen information about a Joanne Fabrics that would go in beside that. Wow, uh, I haven't heard that name in a long time. Okay, <laughs> and then there'll be a small space available just north of Joanne Fabrics towards the Staples for another smaller user, but that hasn't been determined at this okay. point. Uh, and then a little to the south, and by the way, I think the TJ Maxx is supposed to be opening in August. I don't think Joanne's, I've heard the date for opening on that one. And then we've also got uh, to the south a little bit, there's a Qdoba that's under construction. That's a Mexican uh, fast food uh, carry out type of place. Mm. And then you, the Best Buy was there. I think the uh, Party Central is beside that, and there's some space for additional development there. So mm -hmm. I know of two spaces that are available that they, we'd like to, to see filled, that, it, that space north of TJ Maxx and uh, the, the space uh, just north of Best Buy. Okay. And I think there's probably even more prospects for more development along that frontage road. Uh, and, of course, we're always looking for people to fill Aviation Plaza in that neighborhood, but... Uh, we haven't been successful at this point on, on, on that side of the road. Uh, let's see. I think that kind of covers that neighborhood. The, the BP uh, is being replaced by the quick trip. Uh, there won't be uh, a car wash, and it will be the uh, BP with one driveway. That Some people have asked me uh, where the driveway is. There's one driveway to the BP on 9th. Uh, let's see. Good. Can't think well, and you mentioned car wash. The car wash on Witzel by Lourdes, that is um, dead. That has been, they've closed their doors probably about six weeks or so ago, um, mm. which probably was a good thing because half the machines, you know, the bay has never really worked properly. Mm -hmm. um, Although across the street, it's the, the new credit union going in, so mm -hmm. there's a nice big building mm -hmm. getting built Yeah, there. down the street, yep. yeah, down mm -hmm. Witzel further. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, It's it, a process. There's always yeah. businesses that close and always businesses that open, and hopefully we're trying to get ahead even in a bad economy of the getting more businesses open. Yeah. Any, any uh, progress being made with Keeney Island and the Pioneer Inn? I wouldn't say it's specific progress I can point to. Uh, we've had conversations with, with the, the property owner, uh, Decade Properties. Uh, they're still interested in developing that property. Uh, the economy is not right for their type of product when it comes to hospitality uh, residential. Uh, so they're looking at different alternatives for using the marina and the island. And at this point, we're trying to put together, a, say, a market study that would potentially uh, identify those uh, future uses. Uh, probably the biggest thing was getting the hotel mm -hmm. and that hotel project uh, going because we thought that was kind of key. That was the first piece that we want to work on. Mm -hmm. uh, we worked 
very closely with a, a number of people, and there's so many people to thank on that one. Uh, but that's under the pro they've demoed a lot in, on the inside. In fact, the city's building the river walk on the outside as we speak. Mm -hmm. They're demoing. Uh, they're going over the plans. They're going to be bidding that out so it can be renovated, so it can be open uh, the first quarter of 2013. Uh, so get that under our belt, and I think that'll open up more opportunities for redeveloping the South Shore, including the Pioneer. Okay. And right. speaking of the South Shore, we are working on a Riverwalk piece on the South Shore for the very first time. Okay, good. And, and I just, I've just just been informed that our guest is not here yet for the second segment. So we're going to continue a little longer because, and I hope that's fits that's with fine, your yeah. schedule. Because uh, certainly we've got, I mean, we could talk about this for probably the mm -hmm, full hour. Mm -hmm. So if you're good with that, we'll just keep going. Otherwise, sure. they're going to be stuck listening to just Dan and I, and that's not It's not going to fly. So, um, well, I've got new questions. You go ahead with this. I want to listen, mm -hmm. and I've got to, we'll go another route after. Okay, okay. all right. Um, so, the hotel is coming along. That was one of the things I had mm -hmm. on, on the list. And I know you wanted to talk specifically about the River Walk. So, mm -hmm. what can you tell us uh, in a little greater detail about okay. that? Okay, just to remind people, we did the first River Walk piece there by Riverside Park in 2010. And that's the piece that goes from the Leech over to the Convention Center. And then in 2011, we did the piece that is over at the Marion Road area, okay. uh, which goes from Jackson over to Mercury Marine and then around Mercury Marine over to uh, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. It hooks up to the Wyowash Trail there. Uh, so we had that was done in 2011. And now in 2012, we're trying to fill the gap between uh, Main Street and Jackson. We call that the city center portion. Okay. Uh, the city center portion goes but, uh, around uh, the city center office building, but it also now goes to the hotel. Uh, this spring, fortunately, the new owners of the hotel were interested in cooperating with the city, granted the easement, and we were able to, to do a design and bid that out so we can construct both the office portion of the river walk and the hotel portion the same year. So it'll be basically be done from the Leech all the way to UW Oshkosh uh, and the Wyowash Trail uh, here in 2012. Okay. The, the unique thing about the city center portion is it's not going to be the same kind of river walk compared to Riverside Park or Marion where it was concrete and it was riprap or some kind of uh, uh, sheet metal that would be along there. This would be a boardwalk. It's going to be uh, cantilevered out over the water so when people are walking along there it'll be a different type of atmosphere. It'll also still have all the docks that we're looking at. I think there's I want to say 48 sets of finger piers that go out into the water, mm. some of them down by the city center hotel, some kind of in the middle, and some down by Beckett's, if people know where that restaurant is. Mm -hmm. uh, and it'll be a cantilevered and kind of weave around the, the little cove there, mm. uh, there by the courtyard of the city center, then go back out to, to Beckett's and then go out to Jackson Street, and then you could be able to uh, cross Jackson and get to Marion. So. Uh, it'll be a different kind of feel where I think it's going to look pretty neat. Uh, it's going to be bring people to the hotel, uh, to Beckett's, to anything along there. So uh, that's going to complete the North Shore. On the South Shore, which we just started earlier today, we let the construction contract back in May, and the, I believe the contractor mobilized for that project today. That's the first piece on the South Shore. That's at the Wisconsin Avenue Bridge, and then it goes over to the fishing pier at the end of Michigan Street. And that's going to be a different type of river walk. There's a lot of nice trees through there. Uh, we're going to keep all those trees. We're going to kind of wind the, the trail through the trees, restore some of the habitat there, take out some of the, I guess DNR wanted us to take some of the junk out from uh, old things that have fallen in the water there. We're going to restore that habitat, plant some native vegetation. Then when we get to the fishing pier, it's a real nice fishing pier, but the green treated is coming off and we're going to finish it just like the rest of the river walk in the city center where it's going to be the, a nicer grade of, uh, they call it Trex, it's a name brand of type of, of uh, kind of plastic wood. And we're going to include the lighting and the bollards that we're using for the rest of the river walk and we'll have the, the benches uh, very similar to what we're, we've done for the rest of the river walk. So that's the first piece on the south shore uh, here in 2012. We're hoping to continue that going back east towards the lake through the Bulwarks property, eventually through Jeldwin and the Sweetwater Marina, uh, Pioneer Drive all the way around Pioneer Island and the Pioneer Island or the Pioneer Marina. Uh, the, the city capital improvement program uh, right now has all those pieces kind of identified and we're, 
hoping we can get all those done by the end of 2016. Okay. I just have been informed that our guest is here now, so, but I, I want to just touch mm -hmm. on a couple things real, real quick. Mm -hmm. um, any progress being made on getting a grocery store in or close to the downtown area? Well, uh, we think we, it's kind of an opportunity we have with the Morton Pharmacy uh, leaving. We're hoping that something that would be grocery related could oh, relocate in that. The yep. one that they've vacated. Yes. On Jackson? on Jackson? Yes. That would make a wonderful grocery store. That'd be great. Well, that's what we're working yeah. on. Can't, okay. Certainly can't no, no. make any promises, yeah, yeah. but we're trying to yeah. encourage people to look at that site for potential. Good okay. parking, yep. good location. Mm -hmm. And then very quickly, and this is off the subject sort of of development, but your department is involved in this, I guess. Just real quickly touch on this. I got a press release yesterday that the city is going to be implementing an inspection program for drinking water cross-connection and backflow prevention. Does this mean everybody in the city is going to have someone from the city coming into their homes inspecting their connections? No. no. Okay. Uh, Good. That's what we yeah, wanted to know. Relax. For, for <laughs> people who live in houses, all they're going to get is a mailing to yeah. say make sure you don't contaminate the drinking water yeah. by hooking something inappropriate up to the water supply yeah. because we're afraid it might backflow into the city's water supply. But there will be plumbing inspectors going to the institutional, the commercial, uh, industrial to make sure that their uh, all their plumbing fixtures, their boilers, things of that nature aren't hooked up in, in incorrectly and could contaminate the public water supply. So n uh, they'll there'll be inspections for those big type users, mm -hmm. but the individual pro uh, homeowner they're just going to get a mailing to make sure that they they're, they're not they take a look at it and make sure they're aren't, they aren't contaminating the water supply themselves. But no inspector will actually show okay. up unless they invite us. Sure, sure. One well, follow up on that? Yeah, go ahead. What's the cost to the city to hire these people to do this? That I don't know. Okay. Pub Public Works was handling okay. no, that I just, part. Yeah, it was okay. part yep. of the news. Yeah. All right. Yep. Yeah. It's okay. a good question. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for yes. being here and for extending uh, yeah, a little bit good. more time to us. We oh, appreciate yeah, well, you're welcome. Yeah. And, uh, Happy we'll to do it. We'll have you back again soon. Probably I appreciate before the, the year is out. Yeah. I love the invitation. Yeah. All right, terrific. Right. Thanks so much. Just sit tight. We're going to okay. take a short good, break. Thanks. When we come back, we'll be joined by local author and uh, former mm -hmm. uh, history uh, teacher here in town, Ron LaPointe. He's going to talk to us about his uh, most recent book. We'll be right back. Every year, the U.S. Department of the Treasury receives about 1.4 million reports of problems with paper checks. Checks can be lost, stolen, or delayed. If you still receive Social Security payments by paper check, Treasury wants you to know about a safer, more convenient way to get your money. The Direct Express Prepaid Debit MasterCard. The Direct Express card is new and is available to anyone receiving Social Security benefits, even if you don't have a bank account. Your monthly benefits will be automatically placed onto your card account each month on the day your money is due. While other debit cards cost money, it is possible to use the Direct Express card for free to make purchases, pay bills, and get cash at thousands of locations nationwide. There are no sign-up or monthly account fees. No more waiting for the mail or worrying about lost or stolen checks. Call 1-877-212-9991 or visit www.usdirectexpress.com. And welcome back. Uh, Ron LaPointe is here now. He's been on a couple times in the past talking about uh, his first and second book, and now he's written a third book. It is called Oshkosh, Preserving the Past. Uh, the first two uh, were called um, A South Sider Remembers, 
and Oshkosh, The Way We Were. Um, this particular book, if, if you want to hand it to me and I'll hold it sure, up well, here sure. since the Give camera's me. on me, yeah. ah, we'll just cover up your notes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, uh, this is what the uh, cover looks like. Now, this particular book, Ron, has uh, 23 chapters. 11 are primarily about people, and then 12 are about businesses and sports and clubs and so forth. Uh, 62 photos in the book. Dan counted each and every one for me. Uh, <laughs> he says some are dated, some aren't. Um, let's talk about this book in comparison to the other two. This, this is a little bit different. It seems to read differently. It seems to be written differently. Um, why is it different in substance and style to the first two? Mm -hmm. Well, the first book was uh, sort of a memoir of me growing up in the South Side uh, during the 40s and 50s. So I told stories of the South Side, people that I, I met, knew, and places I've been. Uh, second book, um, The Way We Were, somebody gave me the idea to, um, after they read the first book and said, you know, there's a lot of people out there who have a lot of interesting stories to tell about, about the past primarily their past, and uh, he thought I uh, should consider writing a book really based on that. And I eventually did, although I included many of my own stories. I interviewed people, and, and then um, about two years ago, somebody came up to my house by the name of John Allen, who I had known and still knew. Um, he's from the Allens from Allenton, Allenton. And uh, I used to be the Democratic uh, County Chairman, and I was involved many years ago. And he said, he uh, rang my doorbell, and he said, um, uh, I have an idea for your next book. I didn't know I was going to write a next book. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, come on in, John. So we talked for a while. He had a list of, uh, I think, 25 or 30 names. And he said, these people I know, they're from the city, but also from the county. And they have had interesting past, and they have really good stories to tell. I think your readers may be interested in. So um, I said, well, I'll give it some thought, and uh, and I did. And and out of the 25 or 30 names, I think I kept about three of them, the people that I knew because mm -hmm. I wanted it to be contained in the city. And then I added a few myself, and uh, eventually I got 23 stories out of it. But I knew after I thought about that book possibility, that I wanted to write about Stein's, the old women's clothing store. Mm -hmm. I wanted to write about Iwiko Park, that park south of Oshkosh, that closed in 54, I think. I knew I wanted to include Inky Youngworth, mm -hmm. and, um, and I knew I wanted to write about Dan Reddick, uh, the publisher, the collector of photographs. Everybody knows Dan with his motorized cart. And then um, I just added a number after that, after I gave it uh, some thought about who would I like in the book. I had a number of calls, and people had asked me, uh, I have a story to tell. I accepted some and rejected others, and uh, I think I got about six stories from people asking me if their story was appropriate for the book, so I included them. Which like is Jerry's your favorite Mart. book? Uh, the first one. The first one. Yeah, I like this one too. Uh huh. Um, is this the last book? I think so. Uh -huh. <laughs> I don't know. I think so. Yeah, yeah. You're pretty well exhausted, Oshkosh. Well, uh, that's what I think. <laughs> <laughs> You're exhausted. <because laughs> <I'm> ex <laughs> uh, John Allen came up to me uh, again about three weeks ago in a, in a library parking lot. He says, "I got a ah, another idea. I got an idea for your next book." He told me about it. I said, "Well, John, I don't know about that." Anyway. Yeah. Well, actually, though, I do have another idea. If you have, you know, if you think it's a good idea or not, I don't know. Uh, but you know, there are a lot of businesses in downtown. I mean, we, we we're seeing a, resurg a resurgence of of interest in downtown, yeah. a lot of activity downtown, which for many years downtown was thought to be pretty much dead. You mm -hmm. know, um, but you talk about old businesses like Woolworths. You know, that was uh, that was uh, forever a, a you know a cornerstone there on on the corner. You remember where, that one, don't you? Of course, where <laughs> Exclusive Company now is. But you know, talking about some, uh, my thought would be talking about some of the businesses that were icons for so many years, 
and aren't any longer, but then businesses that have been around forever, like the exclusive company, you know. He's been in a few different locations downtown, but he's managed to stick around. Caramel Crisp has been around forever. It's seen different mm -hmm. owners. And you probably remember, and the name is escaping me right, to, right now, there used to be a two-story, um, yeah, I guess it was a clothing store downtown, um, and I'd know the name if I Continental? heard. Continental? No, no, no. Spoon no. and Son? No. Uh -huh. yeah. No. Oh. I'll this, think of it eventually. This is kind of a test. <laughs> but I mean, my my mother shopped there all the time, and the name is just escaping me. But it was. What block was it on? That's a good question. Oh. <laughs> Maybe the four hundred block. Oh, the three, yeah, most of them were there. I don't, I don't remember for oh, sure. Okay, sure. But you know, that might be interesting. And uh, uh, so. Uh, to find uh, people to interview to, uh, you know, to. That's the challenge. Yeah, that's the challenge. Uh, it's not impossible. Certainly. Don't well, bother you, interviewing you me. I can't even remember the name of the store. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm thinking about Woolworths <laughs> yeah. and, and yeah. Kresge. That's an idea, too. But mm -hmm. right now, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you learn anything in, in writing this book? You know, <laughs> that's one of the best parts of writing this kind of a book. I learned more about Oshkosh from interviewing uh, uh, these people. I interviewed about 50 or 60 people, and um, I learned a lot about the history of Oshkosh that I didn't know. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I know something of, the, of Oshkosh like you do because we grew up, grew up here, but um, talking to Jim Staple from Kits and File, talking about Bill Wyman from The Waters, uh, talking to a variety of people, Anki, Richard Verhoeven from Richard School of Dancing, and just... Uh, Jerry, uh, Marty Wiesenberg from Jerry's Bar. What a nice guy. Uh, when you walk into Jerry's Bar, have you ever been there? Mm -hmm. it, well, it's like walking into a time warp. <laughs> I mean, it's 150 years old. Mm -hmm. And they haven't done a whole lot of remodeling to the place. I mean, they have bar stools now and a few other things. But um, those people I learned a lot from. And, and, and a host of other people, too. Yeah. yeah. I really like the book in that you started with the Young Earth boys, Inky in the beginning and Bob at the end. But I have one throbbing question to ask you about <laughs> Bob. In, in book two, Bill Free talks at length about the donation of the public library by Mrs. Kimball and the problem in trying to round up enough votes to pass it. And there's one council member that's not going to go for it unless there's some purging of material in the library. I assumed it was, it was Young Earth. I did too, but it wasn't. Did you ask him? No, I didn't. Why not? Uh, I didn't come <laughs> come to mind at the time, but wow. after I talked to him yeah. about a variety of things, I just concluded my, uh, to myself that it wasn't Bobby. Hmm. That was a great Bobby. Question. Bobby had a very close relationship with Bill Free. Okay. He, he really liked Bill Free a lot. Uh -huh. Bill Free was progressive. You might say Bobby wasn't, but in a sense he was. Um, as I said, he's the essential South Sider. I grew up in the South Side, but not in the, not in the Sacred Heart District like Bobby and Enke did. I played ball with Bobby years ago. <laughs> he was involved in sports. Um, I knew he uh, was a mayor and he served on the city council, and uh, I knew a lot of the, where I, I sort of knew a number of people in the council didn't really care for him. Mm -hmm. I certainly knew the editor of the editorial page in the Northwestern didn't like him at all. Mm -hmm. Not mentioning names. Mm -hmm. um, I can even guess on that one. But yeah. yeah. So, you know, when he became mayor um, and uh, President Bush came into uh, this country in 92 uh, uh, campaigning against Bill Clinton, and the mayor, of course, greeted him along with a number of other important political people. The only paper that covered that, that situation was the Oshkosh West newspaper. The Northwestern was there. No other area newspaper was there. I think I know why. I didn't ask him why because uh -huh. I didn't want to really get into it. But he was, of course, taken aback by the lack of, uh, of the city newspaper uh -huh. coverage. And um, I think he did a few good things for the city of Oshkosh. Uh -huh. I like Bobby a lot. He's not in good shape uh -huh. now. 
And uh, I visited him uh, two or three times up in his apartment at uh, Marion Manor. And, uh, and he had a lot of things to say mm -hmm. and things that I think needed to be said, mm -hmm. preferably on paper. Okay. But Bobby and Enki are different people. Yeah, but what a nice way to start and end the book. Yeah. That's what I thought, too. Okay, I have a writing question, because you've been not only known as a local historian, but you kind of, you look at, as a writer. And I, I find, to be honest with you, the organization of this book kind of confusing. Okay. Uh, you start with an italic section at the beginning of each chapter, yeah. which you write. Yeah. Okay. Then you go to quotes from the people, but then you have double spaces, and then you comment, and then you go back to quotes, and it's... It's hard to follow sometimes. Well, are, it is. Are you aware of, of, I mean, why did you come up with that organization? I wanted to, uh, I wanted to space my comments from, from the interview itself. Okay. But why have the italic thing in the beginning? Well, um, in some of the, uh, in a couple of the stories I didn't. Because okay. I indicated that this story was actually given to me by this one person, like Fred okay. Gaffner in the in a Winnebago um, um, uh, airport. Okay. Uh, uh, story. Um, there was another one too, and I just not off, it's not on top of my head right now. But um, I was hoping it wouldn't be confusing. In fact, I thought just the opposite. But okay. I could have been wrong. Yeah. Was there not enough material in each interview to have the body of each chapter more on the interview? I mean, did you? not use a lot of, of the material you got in each of these interviews or not? Um, no, I no. used just about all of the material okay. Okay. in one way or another. I might have okay. reorganized it a little bit. Okay. Uh, but um, no, I can't think back that I didn't use just about okay. all of it. Okay. Just about all yeah, of yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, okay. Other question, that's a good point. Other question on photos. Couldn't you have guessed the dates on a lot of the photos? Couldn't I have guessed the date? Like Circa Day you have in, in the, the old Latin use. If you don't know the date of a, of a photograph, you write in there Circa Day 1948 or oh. 1952. People like local history because they like to look at what possible dates there are. And a lot of the photos aren't identified at all by That's date. That's true. And uh, I should have corrected that. Okay. That's a good point. Okay. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. I liked it. It was a good read. Okay. And I liked the Young North at the beginning. And I just thought that was kind of the, the book markers for Oshkosh with two brothers, one... Yeah. Quite different in terms of quite their different. achievements. Mm -hmm. Inky's quite the person. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it, it's nice to, and that's what I've enjoyed about all three of your books. And I'm, I'm still reading uh, this one, sure. uh, quite honestly. But, um, you know, I kind of breezed through the chapters that I didn't get to actually read in, in their entirety before tonight. But um, I've, I've enjoyed all three in that it, it does, for those of us who have been here all of our lives, yeah. for the most part, uh, it, it does, you know, preserve memories. Mm -hmm. um, and speaking of preserving now, I, I do have a question. You know, it's the name of the book is, you know, preserving the past. Now, cities, some, can preserve their past and yet at the same time be progressive and they sort of nicely dovetail the mm -hmm. two um, to have past and future and present all complementing sure. each other. Do you think that Oshkosh does a good job of Preserving the past while at the same time being progressive? I didn't think you would ask me that question. <laughs> um, Neither did Dan, but he said, you know what, that's a good question. <laughs> that is a good yeah. question. Well, um, from, uh, you know, looking on everything, I think Oshkosh is doing a pretty good job pre preserving the past um, and looking into the future, too. Uh, people like Bill Wyman from The Waters stuck all kinds of money that he had not anticipated putting into that place. Um, and they wanted to give back to the city. They love Oshkosh. Mm -hmm. They sold products that had Oshkosh on its name, Oshkosh Bagash. Mm -hmm. And so they were willing to do that. Jim Staple, I think from Kitson File, who I had in class many years ago, uh, basically doing the same thing. He's um, He's one of the Yankers on Main Street. And I asked him why they stayed on Main Street as opposed to going out where just about everybody else has. And he said they liked the location. Um, the core of the, uh, I think he said the core of the uh, facilities are on or near Main Street, the museum, the library, uh, the farmer's market, um, and a host of other things that I've, I'm missing. But he said it's always been a really good location for us. And uh, 
So they're celebrating their 100th anniversary next year. Wow. And uh, along with Jerry's Bar last year, they're going to put on uh, some kind of a celebration of sorts. He doesn't know exactly what yet. Um, people like uh, Scott Engel from Jerry's Bar, the new owner, Marty Wiesenberg's grandson, who owns the bar now. Couple, uh, he's in partner with Mike Koplitz, Howie Koplitz's son. Um, Scott and Marty started the Outer Street Fishing mm -hmm. Club, mm -hmm. which has done so much for the city, for fishermen safety, mm -hmm. for providing additional opportunities for the handicapped, for Children. young kids fishing. Uh, these are, in a real sense, progressive-minded people. And there are more. If I would look at my table of contents, I could, <laughs> <laughs> I could probably say it a few more. So is Oshkosh doing a good job here? I think the new city manager is really doing a good job from what I read and from what I hear. And um, uh, one thing I like what he's doing, whether this fits into your question or not, is the streets on the south side of Oshkosh <laughs> are being replaced with either asphalt or concrete. Mm -hmm. And Oshkosh has so many bad streets, not only the south side, but on the east side and, mm -hmm. and some on the north side and west you side You could write too. a book just on bad streets. Oh yeah, <laughs> but I, th that is really improving. Yeah, yeah, yeah it is. Yeah, quick question, if, if, if you as an historian, would you ever change the name of the city from City on Water to Event City? Is uh, that a destruction of, 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 our, of our history? It is a city on the water. I know it. Everyone's an event city, right? You want me to come? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I won, but. Um, okay. He's just one person. He's, you, but he's significant. Uh, that's you right. You won either, I think. That's yeah. right. Well, I don't, I'm not an Oshkonian, but it just seemed to me that that was an historic name that applies to your city. Sure. Yeah. And sure, the sure. other one is generic and plastic and Walmart ish. I mean, it, it doesn't yeah. have any uniqueness to it at all. No. Yeah. That's not. No, it really doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in our final couple of minutes here, you are going to be um, at the Oshkosh Public Library uh, for a book signing and so forth on Wednesday, June 27th. Mm -hmm. So um, the week that this program airs, he will be there. Mm -hmm. And your program there starts at 6.30 in the evening in the yes. lower level meeting room. Yes. Um, I guess you're going to be talking about stories from the book and mm -hmm. um, then people can sit around and, and mm -hmm. reminisce and so forth afterwards sure. and, and um, it's going to be refreshments I going to be refreshments okay. um, uh, Janice Stibble and uh, Lisa Voss who uh, have organized this have invited all of the people who I wrote about in this book to the event oh, uh, how many will come you uh -huh. know well, that's I don't know yeah. but they wanted it they wanted these people to come too sure. and anyone else that may be interested yeah. um, it's always fun to uh, make a presentation at the library. I've done that for each of the books, and uh, and I hope we have a, a nice turnout. Okay, so again, that'll be um, Wednesday, uh, June 27th, starting at 6.30 at the Oshkosh Public Library, yeah. lower level meeting room. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. Ron. We appreciate it very much. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Write that fourth book. Start, start the what book? getting in the fourth book, right? Fourth, <laughs> oh, Walt Wars and Kreskis <laughs> and that clothing store. Well, and I'll try and come <laughs> up with the other. You've got to get the name. Yeah, I'll think of it. <laughs> anyway, thanks Spoons, so much. Spoons, and good, and and good luck with the ones. book. Yeah, well, thank you very much. And that is going to do it for us. We will oh. see you next time. Until then, take care. Keep your oh. eye on us. We've got our eye on Oshkosh.